Hi, this is Gail Christensen. I'm the Associate Director for the Institute of Geophysics at the University of Texas at Austin. Today I'm going to be talking about some recent drilling we've done at the Chicxulub Impact Crater and how we can use physical properties to go beyond what we drilled at the crater to uh, the geophysics of the entire region. This presentation is going to be in two parts and I'd say the first maybe third, maybe 15 minutes will be about the uh, marine geoscience research at UTIG, and then I'll move on to the work uh, about the Chicxulub impact. So um, marine geology and geophysics at UTIG, I'd like to say that we image from the seafloor to the mantle and from the tropics to the poles. So UTIG has been actively involved in marine geology and geophysics since its establishment by uh, Maurice Ewing, otherwise known as Doc, in 1972. So here he is. Um, so for those of you who uh, know Doc Ewing, he, he started the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. And then when he left there, he came uh, to the University of Texas. And um, he started the institute actually in Galveston. Um, and then it moved to Austin in the uh, 80s. Uh, and most notably, I think, that we're the first academic program um, to acquire marine multi-channel seismic data. So we have expertise in various instrumentation and techniques. So if you're interested in any of these, these types of data, uh, feel free to contact some of us. Um, and I'm going to go over some of these uh, in the following slides. So let's start with ocean bottom seismology because that's what I really work on. So here I am surrounded by a, a fleet of ocean bottom seismometers. Here's one in the water. Um, so these, these instruments, they're like seismometers you have on land, except um, they have to be in a pressure sphere. So that's what's shown, sh shown here. Uh, that uh, we send them down to the bottom of the seafloor. And... Um, What's, what's great about them is that uh, then you can uh, uh, get long offset data to them. The longer the offsets, the deeper the, the penetration. And so that allows us to constrain the crustal structure from the seafloor to the upper mantle. Uh, and UTIG has carried out experiments in diverse environments uh, from Antarctica to Alaska using these kind of instruments. So here's just some examples of what you might get out of them. These are from my own research. So here's an example from the, the Gulf of Mexico, which is a rifted margin. And you can see, um, so you get changes in crustal thickness. So that's showing the, the mantle. So uh, we have thick crust here off Florida, a thinner crust in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see the transition. Uh, these velocities give us information about what's... Um, how these processes happen. Uh, so, for example, these higher velocities let us know that um, there's, there's probably some melting involved during the rifting process. Uh, this uh, bottom example is from the Gulf of Alaska, uh, where we went from the Pacific crust to, some, to uh, the Yakutat uh, microplate. And, and so this is shown with a vertical exaggeration of two to one. So, I mean, just look at this, what's going on. We're going from this thin ocean crust to this thick Yakutat crust. And obviously this is a transform fault. So we are able to image, you know, how, how abrupt that change is. And before we acquired these data, uh, there are some ideas that this specific plate was subducting under here. And, you know, obviously that's not happening. So, uh, so, so these are the kind of data sets we can get. Okay, seismic reflection data. I think probably everybody here is familiar with it. So uh, this, I think this is the only, I only have a couple slides, maybe just this one. Um, but this is what we're really known for. We have a, a lot of people who work on seismic reflection data, marine seismic reflection data. This is just a, a list of, you know, some of the projects uh, that have happened, um, uh, you know, some of the data. So this is from a recent paper um, by Xiao Xiao Han, who, uh, just joined our staff uh, from the Cascadia margin, uh, you know, showing the changes in the, the fault direction uh, as you move along the margin. Um, but yeah, you can just see lots and lots of different data sets. Yeah, in the past couple years, uh, data from uh, Chile, uh, off New Zealand, and uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, most of the 3D academic seismic data sets have been acquired uh, with uh, scientists from UTIG. Um, Multi-beam bathymetry, I don't know if you can see this scale, but uh, this is depth going from 16 meters to 19 meters, so just three meters. Um, and so we can get really fine scale uh, bathymetry. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this image is from uh, offshore um, where we drilled for the Chicxulub impact crater. Uh, this was some site survey ahead of time to make sure the drilling platform uh, was stable. Uh, and you can see these really fine details. So you have sand ridges here. I don't know if you can see, but these little pits down here, uh, which are probably karst features. Um, but we, we uh, have experts in, in this kind of acquisition. Uh, CHIRP is a compressed high intensity radar. This is for really shallow, fine scale structure. You can see uh, up here, um, this isn't showing any depths, but um, here you can see these buried channels offshore New York, interpreted here. And here's a close up of this one here. And this is where all the techniques that we have from uh, seismic reflection imaging uh, come in. So we can use those same processing techniques on these data. Um, so get really state of the art images of, of the shallow structure. Uh, another program we have is what we call the rapid response program. This came out of um, often institutes, uh, departments have vision plans. And as we were trying to come up with a vision of, of where we could go at, at one point, we thought that rapid response would be something that we'd be, we have all the tools to do. So this is, you know, after some event happens to quickly go out and capture the data that's ephemeral so that you know you need to get it right away because it might not last um, so for example uh, after a hurricane you know what's happened to the seafloor um, what can you find out um, so this is an example from uh, hurricane sandy in 2013 uh, we had a group that took uh, this ut austin vehicle all the way from austin up to new york and I guess they had the 1,800 miles, 26 hours, and three racks of ribs. You can see it was quite snowy when they got there. Um, but some of the results they got are just really fascinating. And so in order to do these kind of surveys, you have to partner with someone who has the, the conditions beforehand, right? So uh, they got in contact and found colleagues that had different data sets. So then you could go get new data and compare with the older data. So uh, this is showing uh, in this channel, um, showing the changes in bathymetry. So from uh, previous data from 2010, 2011, and then the new data 2013. And these colors are showing the changes. So um, the reds are showing places that are shallower and the blues are places that are deeper. And I think you can see there's a lot of red here. And so what this is showing is that in this channel, there was a lot of deposition that happened after the hurricane. So obviously this is, is um, gonna affect uh, any shipping that goes through here or any pleasure craft. Um, so it has a big effect. But you know, what you find out, and I don't think this is a big surprise, but you know, most of the changes that happen on the seafloor, they're not really gradual changes, they happen in these big events. So this is capturing some of the things that happen in those big events. Uh, the, 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 uh, the same program did some work uh, offshore to look at you know, how do these large storms affect the seafloor. So this is an example showing uh, bathymetry. So this is 2001 and here's 2013. So this is the exact same area and I think you'll see that this looks quite different than this. And um, the interpretation was that there was new deposition. And this is the side scan. So side scan sonar measures the backscatter intensity. And uh, so this was uh, 2001 and this is 2013. And you can see like these big 
dark patches that have a very different reflective character than this. And um, during that program, they uh, put down some little, uh, I don't know if they were doing grab samples or coring, uh, spot cores, but uh, from those places, or actually found that there was mud. And I think they went back, I don't have an image, I think uh, some of the scientists went back later and that mud was gone. So that was something that was just very brief um, that you could find. And other rapid response programs, um, uh, more recently some work after Hurricane Harvey, uh, it's actually, you know, that's very close to home. And, um, we have data, uh, the next slide I'm going to show is from uh, about our field course, but um, our field course has collected data in this area. And so uh, the scientists went back and uh, collected new, new data over the same areas where the previous data was. And this is showing changes over five years. So uh, 2017 for uh, Harvey and in the pre-existing conditions 2012. And the red is showing that there was a lot of deposition going on. And then uh, the blue is um, erosion. So uh, uh, again, these large systems cause very big changes. So this is showing a lot of uh, erosion, a lot of deposition. So there's transport going on. And um, Finally, I want to just talk about our MGNG field course for students. I'm, I'm not involved in the field course. My husband is. Uh, and I think this is a, a, a unique program that we have. And because we have all this equipment, um, we can use this equipment to introduce students to field research. So a lot of our students go out with us when we have um, programs, seagoing programs. But this is an, an intense uh, three-week program to introduce students to all the different all these different data types um, so there's uh, so it's a th yeah about a three-week program and it starts with some lectures beforehand so everybody uh, you know gets an idea of the different data types and the equipment that are going to be used um, and it's always done right after the spring semester so once finals are over the next day uh, these lectures start so it's, we call it the Maymester. I assume you have a, something similar, Maymester. Um, so there's the, the three days of lecture, and then there's one week of field work. So with the field work, um, they pick a location. So um, Galveston, uh, Port Aransas, I think they went to Louisiana one year. So pick a location. And you know there's a lot of work involved in getting housing and stuff for everybody. But, find a location, then go there. And uh, we have a small vessel of our own, uh, which can handle a very small party. And then they uh, lease a larger vessel. Um, so the students go out every day and acquire data. So acquire um, these different types of data. So a lot of what I've been talking about. So. Um, uh, Seismic reflection data, uh, high resolution, so with a small source. The chirp data, bathymetry, sonar, they do some sediment coring, uh, grab sampling, and uh, now someone is involved who, who works with forams, so he's teaching the students about what to do with forams. Um, so uh, the students collect the data and the way it works is that uh, the t students are in teams because we think teams are the way we do, do work uh, in geoscience. So they're in four-person teams, a mixture of undergrads and grads. Um, and so each day, uh, three of the teams go out and then one team stays uh, back on shore and they process data all day. So then they rotate. So each team s spends one day where they're processing the whole time. Uh, and let's see, and then they finish off by coming back. Uh, then they spend a whole week, you know, finishing processing of the data. The, the, each group gets some area to work on, um, and then they have to interpret it and then present it. And this uh, field program is sponsored by uh, industry uh, and, and other sources. 
And so some of the sponsors will actually come to that meeting where the students present the, the results. And uh, the, I'm pretty impressed with the presentations that the students give. All right. And I'd say, yeah, that week of interpretation, that happens like right outside my office and I, I usually take that week off <laughs> and work at home because it's very loud, but you know, the students are really into it and it gets really high ratings. So, so um, that's kind of a summary of a very brief summary of the marine geoscience at UTIG. And I, here are some of my colleagues. Um, I guess I won't go over every single name, um, uh, but, uh, Shaosha Ohan and Chris Lowry just got hired on in September. So they're new additions. Um, uh, Jamie Austin, Ian DL, and Fred Taylor are all um, at halftime now, so they'll uh, be retiring in the next few years, I imagine. Um, but uh, we, we, we have a strong group, and I, I like to think we collaborate a lot. So um, it's not like, so we don't have, I don't have a lab, and this person has a lab and that person has a lab. We have shared labs that we, we all work together. And, and we work with the students together as well. So I'm going to switch to the Chicks Loop, um, but if there's any questions about marine geoscience before I go. Okay, so th this is a, a project close to my heart. So the Chicks Loop Crater, uh, what an impact and uh, so I'm going to be presenting uh, an integration of geophysical and drill drilling results. And this cartoon here is um, something from, uh, so, so uh, the crater is located right off the Yucatan Peninsula. And the locals there all know about the crater. And they're very um, proud of the crater. And they were very proud that a group of international scientists came and drilled off the crater. And so this was a, a cartoon that was published in the local paper. Uh, so it shows these are all the scientists um, going off to the lift boat here. And, uh, and here's the Chicks Loop sign, so. Okay, so uh, some background. Um, evidence correlating Chicks Lube with the um, KPG boundary. Uh, so th this, first of all, this is a, a core that was drilled, um, I think off the East Coast, that shows you know, so, so, um, some of the major features. But these, uh, what we see here, these are like the, the microfossils uh, b before the impact. They were large and diverse. After the impact, you can see they're small and uh, they're, they've lost a lot of, uh, of the uh, diversity. And um, in between is this layer um, that has things like um, uh, the fireball layer, which uh, it says it uh, contains dust and ash fallout. Um, there's these things called spherules. Uh, which are like glass balls, so, so melt droplets. And what, uh, if you look around the world, so this, uh, the hypothesis that there was an impact that was related to the mass extinction was actually from places in Europe. Um, saw this clay layer and they noticed the difference in the fossils above and below the clay layer and the clay layer has iridium, which is a, a signature of an impact. Uh, so distally, so in, for example, in Europe, uh, it's a very, very thin layer. Um, but this is color coded, and um, so the yellow is distal. And you can see the colors change here. So you get, um, the layer gets thicker, uh, the red, you can see it's even thicker, and the purple is, is much, much thicker. So um, based on the thickness of this layer, when people were searching for a possible impact crater, and this was back when people, some people thought this idea was crazy. I think most people thought it was crazy. Uh, it kind of zoomed in on, you know, looking somewhere in the Caribbean 
or um, the Gulf of Mexico region. And um, so as you get to uh, proximal, you get this thick layer um, here, which um, has, uh, we know now that a lot of this is from a tsunami deposit. All right. And this is how the crater was found, was through geophysics, because um, it's buried. But uh, this circular feature in the gravity, and there's a similar one in the magnetics, really brought people to say, hey, you know, is this the crater? And um, these white circles show locations of uh, onshore drilling. Um, so the Mexican oil company Pemex had drilled in this area, I think back in the 50s, because when you see circular features, that's often something you want to look for oil for. Um, and they found what they thought were volcanics. Uh, but when, uh, once people started thinking maybe this is a crater, if you went back and look at those rocks, they're actually you know, not volcanics, they're uh, impact related. And another cool feature that you see are the cenotes. So uh, a cenote is a, it's a Mayan word for uh, water-filled sinkhole and they're just all over the Yucatan, but you can see they form this ring right here. So the black dots are the sinkholes. So they form this ring over what we now know is the crater rim. So the, the crater is controlling the hydrology uh, of, of the Yucatan. And if, uh, when I was, uh, our family went in over spring break to, to visit uh, the Yucatan as a vacation and we went on uh, this little trip to snorkel in some of these cenotes and yeah all the locals you know they'll have they'll tell you about the crater and they know that the crater is uh, controlling these so how does uh, a crater form so what happens is um so you have this high velocity impact and you remove a lot of material so that's what's shown here um, and you remove so much material that you actually get a rebound effect so it's like when you remove a glacier, the land comes back up. As you remove all this material during an impact, you get this big uplift. And for the largest craters, that uplift becomes gravi gravitationally unstable and it collapses. So you get uh, something that looks like this. Um, and so you get these different features, which we call rings. And inside the, the crater itself, you get this peak ring which is from the collapse of this central peak. And all of this happens in just minutes. So it's a very fast process. And I have a video later that shows this. So um, at the Chicxulub impact, um, so I was involved in uh, acquiring uh, s seismic data over the crater uh, back in like 1996 and again in 2005. So this is uh, one of the first images over the crater. And this is for the whole crust. This is a line drawing of the seismic reflection data. And what I really want you to see is that this faulting extends all through the crust down to the Moho. And in case you're wondering how thick is that crust, it's 35 kilometers. So just imagine fault going 35 kilometers down. It's, it's, it's really amazing. Um, and these faults, this is a, a profile, kind of goes right across near the center. Um, you can see things are kind of dipping inward uh, towards the center of the crater. Um, and so down 35 kilometers down, what we can do is um, using our ocean bottom seismometer data, we we're able to image the moho down there and uh, what we could see is that um, the center is actually uplifted this is um, showing how how the change in the moho and it's actually uplifted by 1.5 to 2 kilometers down at 35 kilometers depth so that just kind of gives you an idea of the magnitude of these processes Uh, what would the surface of the crater have looked like? So we know the surface of craters from the moon, Venus, um, and this is an example from uh, the lunar crater Schrodinger, just showing some of the features. So, um, so here's the crater rim through here, um, and here's the peak ring. 
right? So uh, from, from these uh, images, uh, especially from the moon, you know, you can see the surface, but the question really is what's going on deeper? And that's where Chick's lube really comes in is it's a place where we know there's a, uh, these rings and we can, we have geophysics that tell us, you know, what's going on, but we can also drill and get samples. All right, so um, uh, in 2015, we actually went and drilled the crater. Uh, and so this had two components. So the first component was when we drilled. So we used um, what's called a lift boat because um, we're only in 20 meters of water. So we can't use a, a regular the drilling vessel that we have for scientific ocean drilling. So we used a lift boat. And if you've never seen a lift boat, you can see it has these, these kind of like long legs. And um, so it can work as a boat and then when it gets to where it wants to it can put the legs down and lift itself up so that's what's done here and it makes a very stable platform um, and on the lift boat it's very small very confined space um, and uh, on it uh, were all these scientific uh, vans that where we could do measurements and stuff uh, right after the core was was drilled but then all the core was shipped to Germany and a larger group, a larger science party all came and spent, I think three and a half weeks um, really focused on the core. And there all the cores were split. So you can see they're split. So then once they're split, you can take all kinds of measurements. You can take samples. Um, you can, you know, these people are describing the core um, and, and when we do these cores, we, uh, one half we call an archive half, so it stays preserved, and the other half can be sampled uh, for measurements. Okay, so uh, what did we drill? Uh, so we, drill, we, we started drilling at about 550 meters down, um, and then uh, we started coring 550 meters down. Uh, and this is what we got. So. The first rocks we got uh, are typically lime, limestone and various sedimentary rock. And then we got into the impact rocks. So at first we didn't really quite know what we were in um, because when you core, if you don't split them, all you can see are, are like the ends of the core. And you have this plastic liner and you can kind of look through and try to figure out what's going on. So these are like sand-sized particles so it was originally described as sandstone. Uh, but as we went deeper and deeper, it's like, okay, that's not sandstone. And eventually we realized what it is is uh, suivite. So suivite is an impact rock that has uh, uh, impact melt. So when you have a large impact, you actually melt the rock from the pressure. Um, and so the, the melt the class of the melt are in this impact breccia. Um, so that it's very fine at the, at the top, but as you go deeper down, and this is like a 100 meter unit, you can see class get larger and larger. So it's class of melt, class of the basement rock, and class of, the, of carbonate from the platform that was there. So, uh, so that you have this impact breccia, which we call suevite. We uh, went through a 25 meter uh, unit of pure impact melt rock. Uh, and then we just had lots and lots, lots and lots, lots and lots of this uh, fractured granite, granitoid rock. So um, if we look in detail at some of those rocks, uh, uh, even before we went to Germany and split the rock, you know, the, the cores and examined them in detail, we had enough information to know um, some, some things about uh, the, the peak ring. So um, we found shock quartz. So that's something diagnostic of impact craters, as is um, shatter cones. And you form those. Uh, in order to get them, you have to have shock pre pressures of 10 to 35 gigapascals. And then, of course, we also had the impact melt rock. You can see that. Uh, and that's formed at shock pressures greater than 60 gigapascals. So uh, we, we know a lot about um, 
you know, what the pressures were even before we, we split the cores. And, and, and we also had all this brittle faulting in the granite. So, um, so these results are consistent with uh, numerical models um, that we had um, that show, I, I'm going to show, I'm gonna, the next one shows a video, but um, this shows little time steps. Um, so here um, is time zero and we've just had the impact. Then this is forming uh, the, what we call a transient cavity. And during that, rock first uh, moves outward and upward. So outward and upward, so it's moving along here, right? And then uh, there's kind of a collapse that happens and things move inward, right? So outward and then things move inward. And eventually you get this, this little peak, this, this peak ring. And uh, this, this lighter gray is showing sedimentary rock. So you get the peak ring actually forms uh, over sedimentary rock. Um, so I think this will make a little more sense in the video. So let's watch the video. So here's the central uplift. And then you see it collapses. And as it collapses, this collapses this way. But the main thing is this collapsing that way. And those are little numerical artifacts. So, um, <laughs> and uh, these colors, they're only showing the pressures at what forms the peak ring. Obviously, there's a lot of this stuff has undergone peak pressures as well. But um, so this, this model uh, is consistent with what we actually drilled. So we, we think this is a pretty good representation of what happened. And again, this whole peak ring just forms in minutes. So what we, the, the um, models are that these rocks actually f like act as a fluid um, for a few minutes. Because geologists um, have a really hard time with things moving as much as they are. But it's because they act as, as a fluid um, for a few minutes. But, OK. All right, so now I'm going to. Um, talk about the work I've been specifically doing. So that those were kind of results from our, our, our larger group. So I've been working on integrating uh, the geophysical data with the drilling. So this uh, figure shows the gravity over the crater, uh, some of the onshore wells, and then in black is um, the grid we have of seismic data. And this shows where we drilled right here. OK, so before drilling from the geophysical data, what did we know? So here's a seismic image uh, showing the peak ring. And this is where we plan to drill. Uh, so you have this dipping reflectivity. And we think this is showing, um, uh, helps under, when you had the um, collapse of the central peak, it would collapse and move this way. And then these rocks would move that way. So that's this. Um, and then the uh, seismic velocities, what we saw is, I hope you can see these contours are dipping down in this way. So we knew that the rocks of the peak ring have lower velocities than the surrounding rock. So the, the dipping contours show that. So for example, you know, here rocks are you know, uh, 5.2, and over here they're, you know, more like 5.7 or something, so kilometers per second. So, so a big reduction in velocity. And we assumed that was because uh, the basement rocks were highly fractured, but that's where we really had to drill because one question was, if these are basement rocks, why are the velocities so low? Maybe we're not looking at basement rocks. And the other um, information we had were these full waveform images, FWI, uh, over uh, our drill site. And so the, the, um, what we're seeing is seismic reflection data uh, overlain with uh, velocities uh, in the colors. And the thing that really sh jumps out is this light blue, thin light blue layer. And um, 
that was before the drilling. Uh, the idea was that was interpreted as the impact breaches. Um, and if the drilling recovered those impact breaches and found that they were low velocities, then we could use these kind of images to map the impact breccia around the crater. Um, and another thing you can see here is that there's a change in color from green to red. And it's right where this uh, dipping reflection happens. You can't really see the dipping reflection in this, but uh, you have this change in velocity. So again, these are the low velocity a peak ring, higher velocity beside it. And it, it's quite abrupt in these images. OK, so um, we made physical property measurements at a variety of scale from centimeters to meters. Um, so we took these discrete samples. And from that, you can actually get um, uh, density and porosity, uh, P wave velocity. Uh, we had this multi-sensor core logger, which moves along this track and makes uh, density, resistivity, natural gamma radiation, and magnetic susceptibility measurements. And we had uh, downhole measurements. So um, uh, the sonic uh, P wave velocity, a vertical seismic profile, and there are other downhole logs. So what kind of results do we get? Well, first of all, the suavite, so that impact breccia, um, does show up as a low velocity layer. So um, what we're seeing here, this column shows velocity. And if you can see this red, hopefully you can see that there's this dip right here. So it's, it's very abrupt at the top and at the bottom. Um, and then the porosity, big change, much higher here than here. And the density is also low density. So it, there really is, is um, a change in physical properties. And you get really high porosities in these rocks, 20 to 35%. Um, then uh, down lower, the impact melt rock and, and lower suavite, it also has um, some pretty high porosities. Um, let's see. And if we go to the crystalline basement, um, so down here, uh, the velocities we measure are um, like 4, 4 to 4.2 kilometers per second. And if you know anything about regular granites, they're much higher. They're like 5.4 to 5.6. So these are really unusual velocities for granites. And the same with porosities. If you look up the porosity of a granite in a textbook or any, any uh, measurement, it's going to be less than 1%. And we're getting 8 to 13%. So this is all very consistent you know, with, with the fracturing that we saw. Uh, the onshore wells um, found similar values um, for the, the samples they have. They, they, they don't have as many samples. OK, so our interpretation. Um, so these uh, low velocity, low density, high porosity uh, values um, I originally thought, well, these must be from fracturing, but the breccia actually isn't that fractured. Uh, what you really see is alteration. So all the glass that's in there has been altered to clay. So that has uh, uh, properties that are consistent with this. So you know they're very water rich, high porosity, uh, low, low velocity, low density. Uh, and then the, the granite rocks are, are really their, their unusual properties are because of all the, the fracturing and, and sh highly shocked uh, conditions. OK, um, so I don't know how much time I need to leave for questions or? How, how much have you got? Uh, so I, I have some uh, slides showing uh, these full waveform inversion models. OK. <laughs> You heard FWI, and yeah. Uh, so um, these are the new FWI models that we're getting over the crater. Um, so again, here's the peak ring with these, these low, this low uh, velocity layer. And you can see you can you map it. Um, but there's some other features in here that are really interesting. So these reds here, um, we think that's an impact melt sheet. Um, that was an interpretation we had before 
we got these FWI models based on, there's this low frequency reflector. So we, we thought this is an impact melt uh, sheet and because uh, it's in the central center of the crater where we'd expect it. Uh, but uh, I hope you can see these um, kind of up, this, this low velocity layer, especially here, you can see it's, it's, it's going shallower. So it's not just a thin layer. It's, it, it has all this topography. And um, let's see. Um, yeah, here's a zoom in of it. And we think that we have this melt sheet and we have these, uh, this topography of the low velocity layer. And we think that might be showing us something about hydrothermal circulation. So with this melt, we know there's, there's a hydrothermal, we know there's hydrothermal um, circulation going on. A hydrothermal system was set up. So from this melt sheet, this should be the hottest place. And so you can see maybe these are upflow zones. We don't have much data over the center of the crater because the center of the crater is too shallow water for us to get to. But so we just have a few of these. Um, so that's the central basin. Um, here's another line uh, showing another one of these upflow zones associated with this. Um, if we look at the peak ring itself, um, one thing we can see is um, this change in velocity. So here we go from greens to some yellows. So we can use this to help map the peak ring. So you'd think you could just use the topography on top to map the peak ring, but it gets kind of subtle in places. But this change in velocity is really sharp. Um, so we can use that to help map the peak ring. Um, as we get into the annular trough, so we have the central basin, the peak ring, then the annular trough. Um, again, we can map this low velocity layer all throughout and there's some thickness changes. So this is much thicker than like over here. Um, and this, this is a really thick region here. And we also see some places with these reds that could show that there's melt out in the um, annular trough. So this, this is work that we're, we're, we're actively doing right now. So we, we don't really have the full story. Um, but uh, so we can map that low velocity zone layer and we can map the peak <coughs> ring. And if we do that, um, what we can see, so this is uh, in color is showing the, uh, the surface, the KPG surface. So what we thought was right after the impact, uh, what we see in this, this is mapping the top of the low velocity zone. And then um, in black is how the peak ring was uh, mapped before the study. And in here, it's showing what, what I think it is from the velocities. And you can see that things are really narrow here where uh, the low velocity layer is shallower and then it's wider where it's deeper. So I'm not quite sure what that means yet, but um, it, it's an interesting uh, correlation. And then um, when we map the low velocity zone, uh, I haven't uh, gone through and um, done calculations, but what we can see is that, um, so this is the top of the low velocity zone, the bottom, but this is the thickness. So this is kind of what we're looking at. But if you can see these reds, the reds are the thickest part and that's in the uh, central basin. So this uh, low velocity zone is thickest there. It's thinnest on top of the peak ring. Um, that, that's not always clear, but overall it, it does seem to be thinner here. And then uh, it's kind of intermediate thickness out here in the um, annular trough, but I, I need to quantitatively prove that. But there are some big changes, so like, there's this, this area here that looks different and, you know, so, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but you, you want to think, what is this low velocity layer mapping? So we know it's, you know, that impact breccia, but um, if you look in detail at the impact breccia, you know, um, what we think is that uh, the low velocity zone layer is, um, is actually associated with resurge into the crater. So you, 
you have this uh, crater that forms and you have a tsunami that goes out and then um, you start having water come back into this hole that you've created and as it does that it forms this breccia so we think that's what we're mapping um, and so these variations have implications for these research processes but again this is kind of the interpretation that we're, we're working on right now so um, why don't I summarize uh, the presentation? So um, I don't think I'll go over everything, but um, so the granite that we drilled, it's highly fractured, has unusual physical properties, and it's, it's undergone uh, very high pressures. Um, the suavite, which is the impact breccia with, with melt, um, it has unusual properties with especially low velocities, low densities, high porosities. Um, and we can, uh, so, it, so we think, you know, all this um, melt has been altered. And that alteration happened uh, through hydrothermal, um, uh, they're from hydrothermal products. So an important implication is if all that uh, uh, alteration is associated with a hydrothermal system, then that hydrothermal system was widespread because we can map those low velocities throughout. Uh, we think we see a, a melt sheet, um, and, and so again, that gives us uh, more evidence for a widespread hydrothermal system. Um, and uh, let's see, and then we think we can see this upflow from a hydrothermal system, but that upflow uh, we only see in the central basin. So that suggests that uh, whatever hydrothermal system was there was most vigorous in the central uh, a basin. And future work is really, really focused on um, taking these FWI images that we've, we're working on and trying to interpret all the details. There's so much rich information in there uh, and trying to put it all together to really advance our story about processes associated with the impact. And with that, I will end. Thank you. <laughs>